You will not be surprised to hear that when we are stressed, anxious, exhausted, or in crisis, it is more difficult to be creative. It's not impossible, but it does not come as naturally or as easily. When we are stressed, anxious, exhausted, or in crisis, we revert to what we know rather than what might be possible. And as far as survival goes, this is important. If you're standing in the middle of the road and a car is barreling towards you or a loved one, you don't want to think creatively in that moment, but rather just get out of the way of the car. Likewise, in a burning building, you don't creatively think of what all the options available to you might be. You get out and quickly. As far as healing and wholeness go, we need the healing power of the divine to reawaken, re-enliven our creativity so that we might imagine new possibilities for connection with one another and the divine in the midst of the pandemic. And as we find our way forward on the other side of our current crisis. So how might God be inviting us to reimagine the work of the church as we re-emerge and re-enter our buildings? How might God be inviting us to revision our shared mission and ministry? Hi, my name is Heather Bales Baker and I serve alongside the creative people of the United Methodist Church. Our building is located in Osterville, Massachusetts and we are deployed for mission and ministry across Cape Cod, gathering for worship in our homes. We remain together in Christ and committed to serve. We continue our Lenten season of recovery, as we focus on health as essential to our spiritual lives. times of difficulty can impede our ability to stay creative. The picture of our lives can become dulled and hope for a brighter future can fade. We need a touch of inspiration to awaken us from our sleep as we hear in one of our healing stories this week. We also awaken to our agency to seek out the divine healer, reaching out to touch the power we know power that we know can restore our intellect and our imagination. We emerge, ready to re-engage with the world, seeking and seeing solutions, creating different pictures of life renewed, just as a mosaic artist creates beauty from broken pieces of glass. 
Let us acknowledge our need to restore, repair, and renew our holy vessels so that we might be able to create and imagine new possibilities, new solutions. Will you pray with me? God of all possibilities, made in your image, you have tasked us as co-creators of a better world. You gifted us with imagination and the ability to learn and progress, but we are tired. Our energy wanes and enthusiasm wanes. The call for ideas, solutions, workarounds, and adaptations has been nonstop for us all. Whether we are needing to find ways to keep children engaged, learning, and well, or figuring out how to maintain a passion for our work in the midst of trying times, or needing desperately to undo systems of oppression too long affecting our lives and the lives of our neighbors. Not only our livelihoods, but our liveliness is at stake. Too often we want to give up, declare that it is all too hard and simply isolate, waiting out the time for better days. It all feels overwhelming and so we look away, sometimes even from the need in our own community. Help us, healer. Show us our energy reserves. Forgive our cynicism. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. In this time of silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness and our need for forgiveness. I invite you to imagine a warmth begin to arise within the core of your body. It may help to keep your eyes closed. This warm orb of light is deep within you, a flame always there and ready when you need it. This warm glow begins to emerge from the recesses of your inner being to ignite and spark imagination. It floods your whole body until your skin is glowing with it, radiating outward. This light from you offers a beacon for those around you whose own light reflects and multiplies your own. There is now exponentially more radiance. Know this, we are gifted with agency to affect healing in the world, no matter what. We are not alone and we can join with others to magnify hope. Christ will answer when we call when we reach out for what we know can help. For you, for me, for all. Take a deep breath in to let this truth fill you. You are loved. And breathe out with the relief of assurance. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. I invite you to continue to imagine the warmth that surrounds you extending to those nearest to you. Imagine it extending beyond your walls to the neighborhood, to the wider community, to the church, 
and see it spread like the rising sun. Let it expand to all the world. Let this be our peace. Amen. If you have not already, I invite you to open your eyes. The peace of Christ is with you. What a fellowship, what a joy to find, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting And now a time just for our young and curious at heart. Before we do anything else, let's breathe. Remember, when we inhale, we take in oxygen, which our bodies need. And something else happens. In the Bible, we hear these words from Job. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. When we breathe, each breath is a spirit breath. It is the breath of God Almighty in our lungs. Our bodies need oxygen, our brains need oxygen, and our souls need the breath of God, working to heal us from the inside out. So let's start by taking in a deep, slow breath through the nose. And then let the breath stay in your lungs for a couple of seconds. Now slowly sigh the breath out through the mouth. Let's do that one more time. Sometimes we need to play. And play is way more than just for fun. Play brings joy. Play reminds us of the power of being in the moment. Play can be a spirit-filled opportunity to see something not simply for what it is, but for what it can be. Play is about possibilities. During hard times, and this past year has definitely been hard, we can get stuck focusing on what is wrong, what is missing, what we can't do. We can dwell on all the limitations that we didn't ask for, and yet they're a very real part of our lives right now. And God has placed an incredible power in us, a healing power, the power of creativity. In the Bible, we learn that we are created in the image of God. To be created in the image of a creator is to be creative. And this time, we're in now, full of limitations, is a great time to exercise our creativity. So let's play. Before we got together, I went on a stuff safari around my house looking for some different objects. Some are old, some are new, and some were headed for the recycle bin. And I thought it might be fun to take a look at some of these objects and see them not simply for what they are, but for what they can be. I wonder if any of these items, we have a tin and a strainer or a colander, a spoon, we got some fun sticks, um, an old box, some newspaper. I think I have some rubber bands in there. I wonder what we could turn these items into. A drum, an awesome hat, a magic wand, or we could put them together and make something like a kite or a hat. We can make all kinds of fun stuff. So try this at home. With your grown-up's permission, go on a stuff safari. Find objects that you can put into a fun container. I used a Christmas hat box. Who knows what you might have? Then do something with those objects. Maybe you can put on a fun puppet show with them. Maybe you can create something. Maybe you can imagine that they are um, animals or other things. 
With so many things closed right now, let's keep our hearts open and our minds open. Let us be open to all the creative possibilities that God has placed before us. Let us create, let us play, let us imagine, and let us heal. It is wonderfully reassuring to know that no matter what we're going through, we can always turn to God in prayer. We can ask God's help for ourselves and for others. And God, like any true healer, listens. God always hears our prayers. So let's pray together. And remember, pray with your eyes open because there are hand motions. Loving God, we come to you with hearts, with hands, with minds, and with souls in need of your healing touch. Heal us from the inside out so that we may reach out to help heal your world. Amen. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. Amen. Hi, Osterville. I'm Paul David Gannett, Paul and Debbie Gannett's son. I grew up attending Osterville United Methodist Church. These days, I live out in Portland, Oregon with my fiance, Avery. We've been enjoying lockdown with our two cats and pet hamster. Working fills up most of our weeks, but on the weekends, we've been finding joy in the little things like walks around town and leisurely breakfast at home. An ancient word, Matthew 9, verses 18 through 26. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house, he saw the flute players in the crowd making a commotion. He said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put aside, he went in and took her by the hand. The girl got up and reported this spread throughout the district. A word of healing, a word of hope, a word from God. Amen. Oh, there was a woman In Bible days She had been sick So very long But she heard that Jesus Was passing by So she joined A gathering throng And while she was But if I could just trust the heel of his guns, I know I would be made whole. She cried, oh Lord, oh Lord, she cried, oh my Lord. Said if I could just touch Doctors, they've done what they could, but the medicine would do no good. When she touched him, the Savior didn't see. Still he turned around, said, who touched me? She 
said, I just touched the hem of your garment, and I know I will be made whole. She cried, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, she cried, oh, oh, Lord. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know Thank you, Paul David. Our preacher today is the Reverend Dr. Becca Gurrell. Becca serves as the pastor at the United Community Church of Morrisville in Morrisville, Vermont. She is a member of the New England Delegation to General Conference. Becca is also in my cohort for creating a culture of renewal. Some of you don't know me, and some of you are just still trying to get to know me. But even if you know me only a little bit, or this is your first experience with me, you might quickly pick up on the fact that I am an extrovert. Now, this doesn't just mean that I like to talk a lot or that I am comfortable speaking in public settings, although these things are true and helpful in my profession as a clergy person. But it also means that I draw sustaining energy from my interactions with other people. That's, that's maybe more pronounced among people who are considered extroverts, but whether folks are an extrovert or an introvert or an ambivert or any kind of vert, we find that it is true that we as people need interaction with one another. We need each other. We long for each other. We find, for example, that little children, infants especially, absolutely need to be touched, to be held, to be spoken to or sung to, and that babies that are cared for in this way, that are interacted with a lot in their infancy, are healthier and more resilient. In fact, I have a, a friend who is herself a grandma but her grandchildren live far away, some in Chicago and some on the other side of the world, literally. And before COVID, what this friend of mine would do is go into the hospital and take shifts holding babies that were born addicted to opioids because their birth parent had an addiction and, and used these substances and the babies have, have addiction and are going through withdrawal in their own little tiny bodies. And they need to be held and tended and cared for. They need interaction with other people, more interaction than the nursing staff can give. They need that personal connection and that will actually help them process through withdrawal and be stronger and more resilient. We all need one another. As part of our wellness, our wholeness in body, mind, and spirit. I'm the Reverend Dr. Becca Gorell, pastor of the United Community Church in Morrisville, Vermont. And during the season of Lent, I am in connection with my colleagues, lay and clergy, to bring multiple voices hearts, minds, perspectives, lives, lived experiences to the healing stories in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus indeed calls us, reminds us that we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so he values, he offers healing in heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm not usually so pretentious as to use the big titles, but the doctor part is new this week, and it seems relevant, because today I want to reflect with you about the need for strength, for wholeness, for healing of our minds, and how very important this is, how interconnected it is it, as part of our relationships with one another. Now, 
we are seeing in the midst of the pandemic and its isolation, how profoundly we need each other. But I first learned this. I first learned that my, my extroversion existed in the context also of my privilege. In my very first church as a pastor, it was flu season and we were discussing uh, not doing the passing of the peace or at least not shaking hands during the passing of the peace so that we didn't spread germs. We were so far ahead of our time. And after that conversation, a woman came up to me, a, a dear member of the congregation. She had no siblings. She had never married. She had no children. She had no living relatives of any kind. She was older and did not have work any longer. She was entirely alone. And church, church was her family, her community. And she said to me, Pastor, please, please don't take away the handshake during passing of the peace. Some weeks, that is the first and only time all week that another human being touches me. And unfortunately, she was not the last person I would meet who would tell me this story or a story like this. Certainly, adults living on their own, especially older adults, people who do not have employment outside the home, but also people who've been isolated or shunned by a medical condition because of their race or socioeconomic status, because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Children and youth living and, and growing up in homes that are not loving, that are neglectful. And now during the isolation brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, I now know many people who can count the days, the weeks, sometimes even the months between the time when one human being touches them. This causes harm to our bodies, to our spirits, and to our minds. Study after studies, study after study is showing that during the pandemic, the cognitive function of adults in the United States is suffering, particularly older adults who rely on or relied on interactions with others outside the home, particularly in places like church, intergenerational gatherings to stimulate the mind as well as the heart and soul and as well as getting the body moving in and out of the house at least that one time a week. Without the connection with others, conversation, worship, song, and yes, touch, our minds have less to do, are less active, and are actually less healthy, less resilient because we don't have connection with one another right now. It resonates for me so powerfully with, with a woman in this healing story that we have heard. There's two women, right, in this healing story. One very young, a girl even, but two female people healed by Jesus. And that alone makes this story fairly unique. Most of the other healings we've heard about have been men, that come to Jesus. And, and certainly in this case, even for the young girl, it is a man still, a powerful man, a leader who comes to Jesus, interrupts Jesus, dares to interrupt Jesus to ask for healing, but healing for his daughter. And then as Jesus is on his way doing something very important, healing a girl who has died or appeared to have died, there is another person who interrupts him. And this woman, this woman fascinates me. Her story appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so depending on the gospel, we learn some different things about this character, this woman. 
But this woman has a, a flow of blood, an issue of blood, some sort of disorder that is causing bleeding. And like the leper that we heard about the first week of Lent, that means that this woman is not only suffering from an ailment in her body, she is considered spiritually, ritually unclean. Her issue of blood not only renders her unclean, but much like the leper, renders anyone who touches her unclean. She can count the days, the weeks, the months, the years since someone has touched her. And certainly since someone has touched her without recoiling, without having to rush and purify themselves. But she is desperate, desperate for some sort of contact, some sort of connection with another human being. Her ailment has become a spiritual malady that the community uses against her, rendering her invisible, unworthy, dangerous to them and to their sense of purity, to their sense of community and connection to God and one another. And she must be so desperately longing for connection to violate all of these cultural norms to appear in public, in a crowd where anyone could accidentally bump into her. And then to reach out to a man outside her home, to a holy man, a rabbi, to risk making him unclean. And so she thinks to herself, maybe I don't need to touch him but I could just touch his garments, just the, just the fringe, just the edge of his garment, and that would be enough. Maybe that would be enough. And Jesus on his way to heal a girl, a child, a powerful man's daughter, pauses, is interrupted, turns and sees this woman interrupting her isolation, and he calls her daughter. Daughter, your faith, your boldness in violating taboo has made you well. As with the leper, Jesus not only heals this person in body, but begins a process of restoring her to community so that she can be healed in that aspect of her spirit and her need for connection with others. And he does something even more profound and powerful. He begins to offer healing to, to her psyche, to her heart and mind and soul that has been through such incredible isolation for days, for weeks, for months, for years. The scripture tells us that her body is made instantly well, but I imagine that healing of the trauma of isolation takes a lot longer than an instant. But it begins with her being seen by Jesus, being touched, reaching out to touch him and having that not be rejected. She restarts her calendar, her mental clock of how long it's been since another human being looked at her, let alone touched her. But from the place of knowing that it need not be months and years this time. It's a healing I imagine is going to take us some time. We're not in the same situation as this woman who's reaching out to Jesus reaching out for the healing and restoration to community, reaching out for the healing of knowing somehow, somewhere that she is worthy of touch, of love. And the way that her mind and her body have kept her separate from others, knowing, knowing that she is unclean, holding back so that she does not harm anyone else. We now will struggle, I think, recoil a little, even when we're allowed to touch again, to hug, to shake hands, to be in one another's presence without a mask, 
when you see it on TV or, or it happens by accident, doesn't that feel strange now? Our minds have filled in the pattern of isolation and it's going to take us some time to heal that. But what we can do, what we can do each moment is attune ourselves to those who are isolated. Attune ourselves to those who've been pushed to the fringe and the margin. Attune ourselves to those who are reaching out, not only to God, but to beloved community. How do we interrupt the isolation that hinders our health of body, mind, soul, and strength so that we can love God with all of who we are, including the wit and sharpness of our minds, including the strength and vitality of our bodies, including the openness and vulnerability of our hearts, even when each of these is not quite what it used to be. How do we begin to touch one another, even if that touch cannot yet be literal? How do we see one another, even if that sight is not literal? How do we open ourselves to those who are reaching out? Because each part of this story, these remarkable women, young and not so young, in need of healing, Remind us that, that our God is one who will be interrupted, who will pause from one important thing for another, who places no human as more important than any other and certainly none as any less important, but will stop, turn, take notice of those reaching out. Even the ones, especially the ones society says, are not part of this beautiful tapestry, this beautiful mosaic. Christ calls us to be ready. Be ready for the hands reaching out even to the very fringes of ourselves, of our communities, to listen, to look, to have our hearts open to those who have struggled and suffered in isolation, ourselves and others, and to interrupt this isolation, to be in conversation, friendship, community, touch when that is safe and possible, love, service, worship, song, together. How is God calling us as faith communities, to be the places where people can reach out and touch and be touched, can reach out and see and be seen, can interrupt and have their, their longing for connection met. May we take notice and may we, when we reach out, find that it is Christ we touch and who calls us to be in relationship, in connection to one another. Amen. In your love, make us whole. May we rest in your compassion. Calm the lost, weary soul in the warmth of your love. May your peace fill our hearts. May we know the love of Jesus. By your grace, you console. Make us holy. Make us holy. Will you pray with me? Healer of our every ill, especially our malady of exhausted spirits, 
We come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that you are already at work among us, showing us the way to recovery from the toxicities and grief of our time. You remind us that we do not have to shoulder everything alone. We give you thanks that all we must do is orient ourselves toward your divine spirit to accompany us, touch us, inspire us, heal us. We pray especially for all who feel opportunity and possibility is cut off to them. We pray for those whose spirit is continually dampened and damaged by those who fail to see value in their contributions, who steal away rights to the fullness of expression. We give thanks for communities, churches, nonprofits, and businesses that are supporting the flourishing of all voices, especially voices that have been silenced. We give thanks for the courage of innovators who use their resources and creativity to make more good in the world, making goodness a priority over profit. We ask for courage and encouragement to reevaluate how we as a church can join this effort now and into the future. We pray this day for the healers and caregivers in our midst. We pray for those who teach and model creativity, who lead with integrity and openness of spirit. We pray for those who are struggling, who need your healing in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for all who are hurting, grieving, alone, or afraid. We pray for all who are asleep to the suffering of others, to the possibilities of this world, to their own innate gifts or the potential of others. We pray, joining our hearts and voices as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 In your love, make us whole. May we rest in your compassion, calm the lost, weary soul, in the warmth of your love. May your peace fill our hearts, may we know the love of Jesus by your grace. And soul make us holy, make us whole. The words of Jesus that we highlight this week from the healing story are The girl is not dead, but sleeping. We have touched today on our need to be rejuvenated in spirit, to awaken with new vigor for creativity and curiosity. This is the intellectual healing that is spiritual healing. We may feel like we've been slowly dying away these last few months, but Jesus affirms that we are not dying. We perhaps are sleeping. It is the healing we yearn for, to be awakened and reawakened, brought back to life with vitality and vigor for the days ahead. And so this week, I invite you to play with creating a different picture from the brokenness. I invite you to take your broken pieces of sea glass, move them to a flat surface as a mosaic artist would try various configurations when making a work of art. See how you can put them together to make something beautiful. 
even when the raw materials of our lives feel broken. We can get a new perspective that can awaken a new vision for life within us. When you're ready and have found a placement of your pieces that bring a spark of delight, take a photo. If you use a wallpaper on your phone, consider using your photo this week in a way to remind you that you are capable of reworking, remaking, revisioning the pictures of what life can be. Or maybe it is enough to leave your mosaic creation on the table where you see it frequently, or maybe even rearrange it each day, using it as a focal point for prayer. And certainly, if you want to share your photos of your mosaic with us on Facebook or through email, I would be delighted to see them. Each week, we hear Jesus' words and we pay attention to the reaction of the crowd in the healing story. If you have to, go back and read it again. This week, there is an interesting reaction at Jesus' notion that the girl was not dead. They laughed. They laughed at Jesus. Full-blown funeral rites had begun, flutes and all, and yet Jesus said, this is not the end of the story. The idea that we could come back to life better than before, that we could find some way to bring life back to what feels dead, may seem preposterous to some at, that, at this point. Laughable. Imagine, could the church be stronger and healthier after a pandemic? Like Jesus, we need not be deterred. We can forge ahead faithfully. We can enter the house of sorrow and dare to proclaim that life still exists. The body of Christ marches on following in the footsteps of Jesus. And so in our communal discerning, how can our church community become a health hub? How could we offer the healing power of Jesus through our ministry and mission? How can we put our minds to imagining how can we learn about innovative ways that are being created to revive our communities? Who are the bright spots of life among us, among our civic, political, neighborhood organizing leaders? Who is working passionately to alleviate the devastating effects of the pandemics that have raged among us? Let us learn from their wisdom, their creativity, and their vision. Let us find creative ways to partner for the days ahead. Now, go with confidence that we will awaken. We will seek out and reach for the healing solutions that our neighbors, our communities, and our world needs, recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears. You are not dead, you are sleeping. And may the spirit hover, move, and deliver salve to your soul and a spring in your step. Go in peace knowing this. God loves you, and so do I. Amen. <laughs>